tonight we're looking at verses 13 all through to 19. John chapter 17 verse 13 and now come I to thee and these things I speak in the world that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves I have given them thy word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world even as I am not of the world I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil they are not of the world even as I am not of the world sanctify them through thy truth thy word is truth as thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Those are the verses we are looking at today, very deep verses, extensive verses indeed. As you come back to your verse 13, it says, Now come I to thee. We remember that Jesus Christ was praying. He started the prayer at the beginning of the chapter of chapter 17. And the prayer still continued. And therefore, we're looking at this and we're titling the message tonight, Christ's supplication for our sanctification. Christ's intercession for our sanctification. Christ's prayer for our sanctification. But we title it supplication, Christ's supplication for our sanctification. Look at verse 13 again. He says, and now come I to thee. The Lord Jesus Christ had come into the world, but now he knew he was uh, going back to heaven. The departure of Christ from the earth was very near. He was about to go to Calvary. He bowed to die for us. He bowed to shed his blood for salvation, for redemption, for justification, and for sanctification, for everything that we need. And he knew it. He knew he was going back. He was going back home. He was going back to heaven. He was going back to God. He was going back to the Father. Look at that verse 13 again. And now come I to thee. You see the assurance there. You see the certainty there. And you see the confidence with which he said, Now I'm coming back to thee. There is something you need to know about the Lord Jesus Christ. Number one, he knew why he came. Number two, he knew what was to be done. Number three, he knew how to do what he was to do. Number four, he knew where to begin what the Lord had called him to begin. Number five, he knew who to engage along with himself. Number six, he also knew when he will finish and then go back to the Father. Pick that up one by one and think about your life. Think about yourself. That you have come to this life and you understand why you have come. Jesus Christ knew why he came. He came here and was not distracted. He was not diverted. He went on doing exactly what he was called to do. And he was looking at the goal and looking at the destiny and looking at the terminal point. There is where I'm going. And he went and he did without any distraction. Not only that, number two, he knew what he came here to do. And he was connected with that, and he concentrated on that just what you do. And now that he knew that he had finished what he ought to do, he said, now I come to thee in his prayer. And you need to be certain like that, understand like that, that you know why you are here, and you know what you are supposed to do. Number three, he knew how to do it, that it will please the Father. And he used the appropriate method. He used the best method so that he would please the Father in everything that he did. Now, number four, he knew where to begin. And he stayed there. He wasn't, uh, you know, here and there, jumping up and going down. And uh, going about and beating about the bush. Exactly the place he ought to begin. He knew where to begin. Uh, and he stayed there. Number five, he knew who to engage along with himself. And he chose them so that they will do what ought to be done. He knew when, number six, 
the words would have gone around and when he would leave and would have finished the work he was assigned to look at chapter 17 in john chapter 17 studying from verses 13 to 19 the topic tonight christ's supplication for our sanctification there are three things we're looking at number one our separation and preservation from the world number one our separation from the world and preservation from the world number two our sanctification and purity through the word our sanctification and purity through the word number three our service and participation in his work our service and participation in his work number one our separation and preservation from the world come to chapter 17 of john john chapter 17 i'm reading from verse 14 it says i have given them thy word it's talking to the father here is our savior here is the lord he knew what he had taught, he knew what he had commanded, he knew what he had given to the people, to his own disciples, and he said, I have given them thy word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. He'll keep you from evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. You see what Jesus Christ is saying? There are two things there. Number one, the true believer's separation. The true believer's separation. Number two, the transformed believer's preservation. The transformed believer's preservation. Number one, the true believer's separation. You can you see what he said about his own disciples in a chapter verse 14. I pray the Lord will be able to say the same thing about you. He looks at your life, he looks at your heart, he looks at your spirit, he looks at your attitude, he looks at your practice, he looks at your behavior, he follows you to your home, he follows you to the place of work, he knows you and he sees you everywhere. And now he can say this about you, verse 14, I have given him, I have given her the word of God, the word of the Father, and the world has hated him, and the world has hated her, because he is not of the world she is not of the world even as i am not of the world look at the repetition in verse 16 it's not of the world they are not of the world even as even as in the same way to the same level to the same understanding and to the same purpose that i am not of the world they are not of the world even as i am not of the world the true believers separation from the word look at chapter 15 chapter 15 of john i'm reading from verse 18 it says in chapter 15 verse 18 if the world hates you ye you know that it hated me before it hated you if you were of the world the world would have loved its own but because he are not of the world you see how sure he was how confident he was he was happy that these people were genuinely converted they were genuinely born again he was happy that the message of life and the message of salvation of eternal life has worked effectively in the hearts of these people and he could look at them he saw them even when they were not physically with him because he knew all things and he could tell that they were not of the world and he says but i have chosen you out of the world therefore the world hates you again i pray that god will bear testimony concerning you the lord jesus will bear testimony concerning you and look at uh, chapter 29 of proverbs proverbs 29 i'm reading from verse 27 because you see in the message of jesus in the declaration of jesus he said the world hated them how about that how will that happen the world hated them look at chapter 29 proverbs 29 verse 27 an unjust man is an abomination to the just 
an unjust man is an abomination to the just and he that is upright in the way is abomination to the wicked because their lives are different these ones are converted but these ones are too corrupt these ones are upright but these ones are wayward these ones are cleansed but these ones are defiled and the oil and water they will not mix there's a separation here and it says because this one is just and because that one is unjust that's why the unjust will hate the just this one is righteous and that one is unrighteous that's why the unrighteous will hate the righteous look at that verse again and measure your life with this if the thieves love you if the robbers love you if the people that are reprobates if they love you if all the people are saying hey hey yeah master you are this and that and they love you and yet they're evil then you can tell you're on their side and thank god i'm not on their side Look at verse 27, an unjust man is an abomination to the just, and he that is upright in the way is abomination to the wicked. In fact, when the Lord called the children of Israel, he made that separation very clear, that distinction very clear. We're looking at Leviticus chapter 20. Leviticus chapter 20, I'm reading from verse 23. Leviticus chapter 20, and we're looking at verse 23. If you are a real child of God, God, if you are really born again, your life will be so different, your life will be so bright, and your light will so shine that the people in darkness will know you are not part of them. The people in occultism will know you are not part of them. And the people who are still drinking sin, eating sin, dressing sin, and going about in sinful ways, they will know you are not part of them because there's the true believer separation from the world. Leviticus chapter 20, I read from verse 23. Look at it it says and ye shall not walk in the manners of the nation which i cast out before you for they committed all these things and therefore i abhorred them i detested them i rejected them i threw them away i destroyed them look at verse 24 there in verse 24 it tells us but I have said unto you, ye shall inherit their land, and I will give it unto you to possess it, a land that flows with milk and honey. I am the Lord your God, which have, give me the word there, tell me out aloud, say it confidently separated you from other people they're not of the world even as i am not of the world you're not copying them you're not copying their style you're not copying their language you're not copying their waywardness you're not copying their evil you're not copying their devilishness you're not copying their waywardness you're not copying anything they're doing look at verse 26 and ye shall be holy unto me for I, the Lord, am holy, and have severed you, separated you from other people that ye should be mine. And so you see what Jesus was saying about his own disciples, even from the Old Testament, they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Jeremiah chapter 10. We're looking at Jeremiah chapter 10. You see the same thing going on uh, here. Jeremiah chapter 10, and I'm reading from verses 1 and 2. Jeremiah chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. Hear ye the word which the Lord speaks unto you who is the Lord talking to tonight I said who is the Lord talking to tonight hear ye the word which the Lord speaketh unto you look at verse 2 thus says the Lord learn not the way of the heathen learn not the way of the hidden how do the hiddens uh, the, you know the pagans the unbelievers the idol worshippers how do they do this how do they do this how do they marry how do they celebrate when they have children? How do they celebrate when they have cars? How do they celebrate when they have promotion? Learn not the way of the heathen. How do they conduct their burial ceremony? Learn not the way of the heathen. How do they uh, do expo? How do they, you know, give bribes so they can have this? Learn not the way of the heathen. You see, if we're children of God, if we're born again, there's such a much difference, distinction between the believer and the unbeliever. That's why Jesus said, I've given them thy word. And the world has hated them because they're not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I 
pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that you'll keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. It tells us in Romans uh, chapter 3, Romans chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 19. In Romans chapter 3, verse 19, here is the reason we're not of the world. As the reason we're different from the world, look at this, verse 19, Romans chapter 3. Now we know that what things soever the Lord says, it says to them that are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world, and all the world, and all the world may become guilty before God. You know, if you're like the world, then you're guilty with the world. You're condemned with the world. You're defiled with the world. You're going to be punished with the world. But because it says the whole world is guilty before him. But you are not of the world. I said you are not of the world. Uh, you are not sure? You are not sure? Look at, look at uh, First John chapter 2, First John chapter 2. You see the people who are born again, there is a difference. Difference in their thoughts and difference in their lifestyle and difference in their action, difference in their behavior, difference in their family setup. Look at this, First John chapter 2 verse 15. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the loss of the flesh and the loss of their eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father but of the world and the world passeth away. Their fashion is passing away and their fads, they are passing away. All the things they're doing, they are not stable. You find them this year, this is what they follow. You find them another time, that's what they follow. And the world passeth away and the laws thereof. But he that doeth the will of God, tell me, abideth forever. If you want to abide forever, you are not going to be like the people of the world. You'll not be doing the things that the worldly people that they are doing. It tells us in Second Peter chapter 2 verse 20. Second Peter chapter 2 verse 20. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world, you see there's pollution in the world. There's dirt in the world. There's defilement in the world. And all these things are abominations in the world. And when you become born again, when you give your life to Jesus Christ, and when he touches your life, and when he forgives your sins, and when he redeems you, and when he cleanses your heart, and when he converts you, you escape the pollutions of the world. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world, it says through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, if they are again entangled therein what's the word we give for that i said what's the word for that if somebody became born again escaped and is born again and now is back again entangled what's the word for that backsliding it's gone back it's gone back it's gone back into the wilderness it's gone back into his vomit it's gone back into defilement it's gone back into pollution it's part of the world again and christ cannot testify about him anymore christ cannot be a witness anymore that is not of the world even as i'm not of the world because it's again entangled therein and overcome the latter end is worse for them than the beginning it will not happen to you. Yeah. Look at verse 21. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. Verse 22. But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb. The dog is turned to his own vomit again. And the so the swine, the pig that was washed to a wallowing in the mire. Look at James chapter 1. James chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 27. James chapter 1, verse 27. Pure religion. That's in pure religion. That's traditional religion. That's religion that does not save. That's religion that you know, is just nominal, head knowledge. Go to church, come back the same way. Go for revival, come back the same way. Go for crusade, come back the same way. But it's pure religion. I believe that's what you have. I say that's what you have. 
and the Lord confirmed pure religion in your life in Jesus' name. It says, pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, look at this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself, tell me, unspotted from the world. To keep himself unspotted, undefiled, unstained, untainted, uncontaminated from the world. We're looking at James chapter 4 verse 4. James chapter 4 verse 4. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world, the fellowship of the world, love for the world is enmity with God, whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world, eating what they are eating, drinking what they are drinking, going to the same nightclub and going to their cinemas and everything, whosoever will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. I pray you will not be an enemy of God. We are coming back, we are coming back to John chapter 17. John chapter 17, uh, this point one deals with number one, our separation from the world. Number two, this point one deals with the transformed believers preservation of from the world the transformed believers preservation from the world we're looking at a john chapter 17 and we're looking at a verse 15 i pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil there's evil in the world because there's a devil in the world. And because there's evil in the world, devil in the world, that's why the Lord is saying God will preserve you. And God will protect you from the evil in the world. Actually, when you are born again, that system of uh, deliverance and that system of uh, protection and preservation is already within uh, that salvation. Galatians chapter 1. In Galatians chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 4. Galatians chapter 1 verse 4, who gave himself for our sins. That's talking about Calvary. That's talking about the cross of Jesus. That's talking about the sacrifice of Jesus Christ for our salvation. Who gave himself for our sins. That he might deliver us from this present evil world. I am delivered. I said I am delivered from this present evil world. Any evil in your community, you will not be part of that. It will not affect you. It will not come into your family. Who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God our, our Father. We're looking at Galatians chapter 6, verse 14. Galatians chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 14. But God forbid that I should glory. Save in the cross, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I am crucified unto the world. It says we have nothing in common. It's like they've crucified you on the cross. They have rejected you. They have sent you away from them. I'm saying that's all right. I am crucified to the world, and the world is crucified unto me. The evil of the world will not touch your life. Second Timothy chapter 4 verse 18. Second Timothy chapter 4 verse 18. And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work. I think this is good for you to repeat for yourself. And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work. Can you say that again? And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work. Do you believe that? The Lord will do it. He'll preserve you. Amen. He'll protect you. Amen. And the every evil work of any occultism, any power, thank God you are free. Let, let me read it now for you. It says, and the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me. Preservation for you. Amen. Will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. We're looking at First John, First John chapter four, First John chapter four. I'm reading from verse three. 
First John chapter 4, we're reading from verse 3. And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist. The spirit in the world is a spirit opposed to Christ of the Antichrist. It will not attach itself unto you. It says, whereof ye have heard that it shall come, and even now already is it in the world. Ye of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Greater is he. Greater is he. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Tell me, how can they conquer you? Tell me, how, how can they suck you up? Tell me, how can they hide you in their dirty work? You are preserved in Jesus' name. Look at verse, look at verse 5. They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth us not. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error chapter 5 chapter 5 uh, i'm reading from verse 4 chapter 5 verse 4 for whatsoever is born of god overcometh the world and this is the victory that overcometh the world even our faith who is he that overcometh the world but he that believeth that jesus is the son of god Look at verse 18. You need to mark this one in your Bible. Verse 18. What did I say to you do to verse 18? Mark it in your Bible. We know. Thank God I know. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. But he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one touches him not. Can they touch you? Will they touch you? Can they destroy your life? No. They have come, they have come, they want to destroy me. Don't say that again. They cannot. I said they cannot. Look at that. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. And he that is begotten of God keepeth himself. And that wicked one touches him not. Wherever they are coming from, they cannot touch you. Verse 19, and we know that we are of God, and the whole world lies in wickedness. Look at verse 21, little children, keep yourselves from idols. We're coming to point number two now, point number two, and we'll come back to John chapter 17. John chapter 17, I'm reading from verse 17, John chapter 17, verse 17 our sanctification and purity is through the word our sanctification after we're saved after we're born again and our names are written in the book of life there is still another experience that christ gives and he provided that on the cross of calvary and he prayed for that look at this chapter 17 verse 17 sanctify them through thy truth thy word is truth go to verse 9 in verse 9 i pray for them I pray not for the world. You see, the world cannot have sanctification. The world can have salvation. They have to start there. When you start school, you have to go, you have to start at level one. You have to you have the rudiments first. And so when you come into the kingdom of God, you cannot say, I want sanctification. No, you begin at salvation. So Jesus said, the prayer I'm praying, I pray for them, I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. Look at verse 20. In verse 20, neither pray I for these alone. What that means is, Neither pray I for these eleven disciples and not me alone. Judas has got was not there. Twelve minus one is eleven. Neither pray I for these eleven disciples alone, but for them also, which shall believe on me through their word. Any believer in the house today? Praise the Lord, he prayed for you. 
I said he prayed for you. What's the prayer? What's the prayer? But 17, sanctify them. Through thy truth, thy word is truth. Our sanctification and purity through the word. Look at this. Number one, I divide this to various sections. Number one is prayer for our sanctification. It's prayer for our sanctification. We're looking at uh, First Thessalonians chapter 5. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. And the very God of peace sanctify you holy. He will sanctify you holy. And I pray, and I pray God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. Can you be sanctified? Yes. Will you be sanctified? Yes. When you are sanctified, would it remain permanent? Yes. Amen. Yes. I said amen for you. Yes. It's affirmed in your life. Yes. It will be done in your life. Yes. Faithful is he who has called you. He will do it in Jesus' name. Number one, his prayer for our sanctification. Number two, the purity through sanctification. The purity through sanctification. In Titus chapter 2, Titus chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 14. It says, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from, how many iniquities? All iniquity, and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works look up here when you have salvation you are a purchased person you are a pardoned person that's number one but now you go forward now you go from being pardoned or being purchased and you become peculiar any peculiar person here today the lord will confirm it in your life who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works we're looking at first thessalonians chapter four first thessalonians chapter four and we're reading from verse 3. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification. It's the will of God, you will accomplish it in your life. That you should abstain from fornication. And that every one of you, how many of us? Only the pastor? Only the preacher? Only our mothers in the Lord? How many of us? everyone that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in tell me now sanctification. sanctification and honor number one his prayer for sanctification number two the purity through sanctification number three the provision for our sanctification he provided for it the provision for our sanctification we're looking at ephesians chapter 5 and i'm reading from verse 25 ephesians chapter 5 verse 25 husbands love your wives even as christ also loved the church and gave himself for it that's not for the world for the world he gave himself so they can be saved he gave himself so that their sins can be forgiven but you are not part of the church you are born again and there's a second step there's a second experience he said christ also loved the church and he gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word that he might uh, presented to himself a glorious church a glorious church look up here there is a graceless church where they don't preach grace they don't preach salvation they don't preach eternal life they don't preach about getting to heaven just religion just religion and the grace of god is not there you go in you come out the same way you came there's no change there's no transformation but first of all there's the grace of god and that's a gracious church gracious church and now they're gracious in their experience because they're born again they're gracious in their interaction because they are born again the way they deal with each other relate with each other they think of each they have love they're gracious but then after the first experience of grace there's the next experience of sanctification that makes you part of the glorious church it will happen 
it says that he might present it to himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing but that it should be holy and without blemish the provision for our sanctification we're coming to hebrews chapter 2 hebrews chapter 2 and i'm reading here from verse 9 hebrews chapter 2 we're reading from verse 9 it tells us in hebrews chapter 2 verse 9 but we see jesus you see him by faith who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death crouched with his glory and honor that he by the grace of god that's what i was talking about the grace of god is for salvation should taste death for every man that for it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons where unto glory you see that first of all the grace of god is there and then eternal death is taken away from you and the judgment of death is taken away from you but now there's a second step it brings you to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering for both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one for which cause is not ashamed to call them brethren there's the provision for our sanctification number four the purpose of our sanctification everything has a purpose whatever christ does as a purpose he saved us and he said that's not enough and he wants to take us further there must be a purpose to this the purpose of our sanctification we're coming to hebrews chapter 10 hebrews chapter 10 and i'm reading from verse 14 hebrews chapter 10 reading from verse 14 it says in verse 14 for by one offering i see perfected forever them that are sanctified what's the purpose he wants to perfect us he wants to perfect you Look at verse 14 again. For by one offering, he has perfected forever them that are sanctified. And look at verse 16. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their where? In their hearts and in their minds will I write them. You remember that God wrote the law on the tables of stone. And people read that. And then when the you know, situation comes, they can forget. And how many times, you know, we hear something, we hear something, we hear something. And then we forget. And the Lord said, you know what I'm going to do for you? I'm going to sanctify you. Is he talking to you? And then he says, the purpose is, I'll perfect you, and then that law will not be far away. I'm going to write that law inside your heart, in, uh, inside you. The Lord will do it. Yeah. Romans, Romans chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 6, the purpose of our sanctification. Romans chapter 6, we're looking at verse 6, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that salvation, the salvation, the old man, the old nature is crucified. But it goes on that the body of sin, the totality of sin, the root of sin, the one that generates sin, it says that the nature of sin might be, what's the word there? Destroyed. That's sanctification. When it's crucified, it's not dead yet, but crucified. That's salvation. But now it says that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth you should not serve sin. Number five, the price of our sanctification. The price. What price did he pay? What's the price for that sanctification? Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13, he paid a price. It's like if somebody paid a price for you to collect now because everything has been paid for. And then you go there and then he asks you, have you gone to collect that thing I paid for? Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't have time. But that thing is so precious and i brought all my income all my everything i've got and i paid for that thing on your behalf the lord shed his blood and he paid the price for your sanctification and you will not say i didn't have time to go and have that thing you are going to have it 
Uh, look at uh, chapter 13, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 12. Hebrews 13, verse 12, wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with what? With his own blood, suffered without the gate. Let us go forth, therefore, do something about that. Consecrate your life. Give yourself and then abandon yourself to the Lord. He says, let us go forth, therefore, without the camp, bearing his reproach. For here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. He paid the price. Look at verse 20. Verse 20 of that same chapter 13. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant. You see the price there, the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, walking in you that which is well pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Yeah. Amen. Number six, the preparation for our sanctification. What do I do? How do I prepare? We know that when somebody needs to get saved, there's a preparation. He hears the word of God. There's conviction of the word of God. And then he repents. And when he repents, he believes on the Lord Jesus Christ and salvation comes. I about sanctification. What do we do? Our preparation for sanctification. We're coming to Leviticus chapter 20. Leviticus chapter 20, I'm reading from verses 7 and 8. Leviticus chapter 20, I'm reading from verses 7 and 8. It tells us here, verses 7 and 8, it says, Sanctify yourselves, therefore. It says, yes, I'm the one to sanctify you, but you'll sanctify yourself. you set yourself apart. Any defilement, any sin that you know, this is not right, this is not right, this is not right. As I'm born again, I need to live the privileged life of being born again. Sanctify yourselves, therefore, and be ye holy, for I am the Lord your God. Look at verse 8, and ye shall keep my statutes and do them. That's true. Whatever he has told you already, and whatever you know already as child of God, how to do this, how to do that. I need to correct that thing. I need to make that thing right. That's not a right. I need to change that. You can do, you do all that in preparation. Then it says, I am the Lord which sanctify you. I am the Lord which sanctify you. You make the proper preparation and then sanctification will come. Look at Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah chapter 6, and I'm reading from verse 1. Isaiah chapter 6, we're reading from verse 1. It says, in the year that King, King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon his throne, high and lifted up. And his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphim, each one had six wings, and with twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet. And with twain he did fly and one cried to another and said holy 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 our god is holy our god is pure our god is righteous it says holy 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 is the lord of hosts the whole earth is full of his glory and the post of the door uh, moved at the voice of him that cried and the house was filled with smoke then said i when you saw the glory of God, when you saw the holiness of God, when you saw the brightness of those angels, and he compared all that with himself, he knew that he had been a prophet. And you see in chapter 1, he had been preaching salvation. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they'll be as white as snow. He's been preaching salvation. He preached salvation in chapter 2, and even in chapter 3, and chapter 4, and chapter 5. And now he looks at himself, although he was saved, but but he said, woe is me, for I am undone, because I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, and which he had taken with the tongue from off the altar, and he laid it upon my mouth. Something will happen today. A fire that burns every impurity will be taken away. 
the fire, the flame that takes away every defilement, inner defilement, everything will go away in Jesus' name. There is sanctification. There's a second walk of grace that the Lord does in the heart. It says, He laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this has touched thy leaves, and thy iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Purged. That's the purification. That is the sanctification. You prepare for it. You see, He demanded for it. He prayed for it. He confessed that He needed something more. And that thing that was more, the Lord did it he'll do it for you we're coming to second corinthians chapter 7 second corinthians chapter 7 i read from verse 1 the preparation that we need to make for our sanctification look at this it says and having not therefore these promises dearly beloved let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit perfecting holiness in the fear of god that's what we need to do and as we do it, the Lord himself will sanctify us in Jesus' name. Number one is there is prayer for our sanctification. Number two, the purity through sanctification. Number three, the provision for our sanctification. Number four, the purpose of our sanctification. Number five, the price of our sanctification. Number six, the preparation for sanctification. Number seven, our preservation in sanctification. So that we get it, we will not lose it. You have it, you will not lose it. You take it to the office. You bring it back home. You take it to your farm. You bring it back home. That's sanctification. You take it to the boss. You will not drop it in the boss. You bring it back home. And when you are coming to church, what do you come with? sanctification and you preserve it in the church and when you are going back home you take it along with you preservation will remain preserved in sanctification in jesus name the uh, preservation in uh, sanctification we're coming to jude reading from verse 21 jude reading from verse 21 it tells us in verse 21 of jude only one chapter it says keep yourselves in the love of god keep yourselves in the love of god looking for the mercy of our lord jesus christ unto eternal life keep yourself keep yourself anything that will stain uh, your white garment you're not going to allow that sin anything that will come to your life and take the sanctification away from your heart from your spirit from your temper from your attitude from your interaction and from your devotion to the lord you will not allow it in jesus name keep yourselves in the love of god looking for the mercy of our lord jesus christ unto eternal life look at verse 24 now unto him that's able to keep you from falling you keep yourself and the Lord is also going to keep you unto him that's able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God our Savior the glory and majesty dominion and power but now and ever Amen. Amen. We are coming to First Peter chapter First Peter chapter one. First Peter chapter one. I'm reading from verse three. First Peter chapter one, verse three. It says, "Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which, according to His abundant mercy, has begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible." and undefiled that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you who are kept look at this who are kept who are kept by the power of god through faith unto salvation that's final salvation ready to be revealed in the last time the lord will keep you first john chapter 2 first john chapter 2 i'm reading from verse 24 first john chapter 2 verse 24 
let that therefore abide in you everything you are learning let that therefore abide in you everything you have experienced let that therefore abide in you which ye have heard from the beginning if that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you ye shall also continue in the son and in the father i will continue you'll continue in jesus name Nothing will take your place away from you in the kingdom of God in Jesus' name. And this great sanctification that Jesus Christ prayed for, it will be yours in Jesus' name. We're coming to point number three now, our service and participation in his work. Our service and participation in his work. We're coming to John chapter 17. John chapter 17 verse 18 John chapter 17 verse 18 as thou hast sent me into the world even so have I also sent them into the world look at what Jesus is saying now he's transferring the ministry to you he's transferring the service to you and he says as the father had sent him into the world that the first part of that verse the second part of that verse so even so have I also sent them into the world look at the first part as thou hast sent me into the world as thou hast sent me into the world look at john chapter 20 verse 21 john chapter 20 verse 21 it says in verse 21 then said jesus to them again peace be unto you as my father have sent me even so send i you as my father have sent me even so send i you the father sent him what did the father send him to do look at john chapter 4 john chapter 4 we're looking at verse 34 john chapter 4 verse 34 jesus said unto them my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work he gave him the work to do he gave him the work to do and he said my father sent me and he sent me to do a particular work and i'm doing it and until i finish i will not stop and he's saying that the same way the father sent me into the world to get something done the same way i'm sending into the world to get that same thing done what is it the work that the father he gave him to do luke chapter 5 verse 32 luke chapter 5 verse 32 the work he gave him to do and then you understand the meaning of what he said as my father have sent me into the world Luke chapter 5 verse 32 I came not to call the righteous but the sinners to repentance that's the work that's the work I came to call sinners to repentance and he says the same work the father gave me to do calling sinners to repentance that's the same work I am giving you to do Luke chapter 19 I'm reading Reading from verse 10 Luke chapter 19 reading from verse 10 look at verse 10 for the son of man is come to seek and to save that which was lost that's the work that's the work the father gave him that work to do to seek the lost and to save the lost we're coming to first timothy chapter one first timothy chapter one we're reading from verse 15 the father sent me into the world what did he send him to do look at first timothy chapter one verse 15 this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that christ jesus came into the world to do what to save sinners that's the work that's the work to save us sinners that means reaching out to the sinner preaching the word of god to them calling them to repentance and showing them how they will have the salvation of the lord why because in second peter chapter 3 verse 9 second peter chapter 3 verse 9 it says the lord is not slack concerning his promise as some men come slackness but his long suffering towards word not willing that any shall perish that's why the father sent the son into the world not willing that any shall perish 
but that all should come to repentance. All should come to repentance. That's the work he came to do. And everyone he spoke to, he wanted them to come to repentance. He said, that's the work he gave me to do. And the work the Father has given me to do, I will finish. And he has given you the work now. I said he has given you the work now. First John chapter 4 verse 9. First John chapter 4 verse 9. In this was manifested the love of God toward us. Listen to this. Because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. That they might have eternal life through him. John chapter 3. In John chapter 3, reading from verse 16, John chapter 3, reading from verse 16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Look at verse 17, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That's the work. That's the work. And come back now to John chapter 17. You understand when he said in verse 18, As thou hast sent me into the world to call sinners in the world to repentance, to bring salvation to the sinners in the world, it says, look at the second part of that verse 18, even so. Even so, for the same purpose, even so, for the same work, even so, to realize the same thing, even though to seek and to save that which was lost, even so, have I also sent them into the world. Even so, have I also sent them into the world. You see what the Lord has done? He said, I'm leaving, I'm going back to heaven, and now I leave the work with you. And the same passion I have, that same passion you ought to have. The same compassion that Jesus had, that same compassion you ought to have. The same zeal that Jesus had, that same zeal you ought to have. And the same devotion, consecration that Jesus had in reaching after those sinners, in same my meat is to do the will of him to, uh, that sent me and to finish his work. That's the same zeal, the same passion, the same courage, the same commitment, and the same consecration you ought to have. And look at that John again, chapter 20, verse 21. John chapter 20, verse 21. Then said Jesus to them again, peace be unto you. Peace be unto you. As my Father has sent me, even so send I you. Come to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28 is giving us the same work. The same work of redemption. And the same work of going to the sinners and telling them about the Jesus who died. About the Jesus who became the Savior. About the Jesus they need to call so that they will have the salvation of the Lord. Matthew chapter 28 verse 18 and Jesus came and spake unto them saying all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth go ye therefore and teach how many people all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you and lo I am with you always even to the end of the world Amen. and the church said Amen. Mark chapter 16 the work he has given us to do as my father has sent me even so send I you Mark Chapter 16, verse 15. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world. Go ye into all the world. Don't stay in a, you know, a little corner somewhere. Don't stay in a little local government somewhere. Don't stay in a little backyard somewhere, community somewhere. Go ye into all the world and touch every life. And tell everyone that Jesus Christ died and he paid the price for their redemption, for their salvation. Go ye into all the world. Make the move. Take the initiative. Come out of your house and come out of your comfort zone. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel 
of the good news of salvation to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. I pray the people that listen to you, they will hear the gospel. They will believe the good news. They will repent of their sins. And they will turn to the Lord and be born again in Jesus' name. We're looking at Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. I'm reading from verse 45. Luke chapter 24, verse 45. Then open he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. And then he says, and he said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus they behoved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sin repentance and removal of sin repentance and the salvation the cleansing from sin the forgiveness from sin that as we talk to the people it's not just to preach we will not leave them in their sin we will not leave them in their defilement. We will not leave them in their condemnation. But as the Lord himself has told people when he was here on earth, and he brought them to repentance, and he brought them to regeneration, and he brought them to salvation, and he brought them to conversion, even so we are going to do in Jesus' name. And that repentance and remission of sin,